Well, hello, and thank you very much for inviting me to come and speak to you today. I am um, what you could term a recovering motorsport engineer in that uh, this, the car, red car on the left is the sort of vehicle I used to design. And I got out in the late 90s for environmental reasons, not knowing what on earth I was going to do, but I knew it was going to be nothing to do with cars. And in 1999, I started looking into the uh, commercial feasibility of bringing hydrogen cars to market. And I've been working on it ever since, so um, I couldn't have been more wrong, really. The car at the top, the Echo, is the first fuel cell car I built in 2003. And at the bottom right is a thing called Life Car, which we built with the help of a grant from the UK Technology Strategy Board and a consortium of universities and um, companies like Morgan, who, uh, and we showed this on the Morgan stand at the Geneva Motor Show in 2008. I, with a number of partners, I set up River Simple as a sustainable car company, not a hydrogen car company. And this is our purpose statement. And it's not some sort of fluffy mission statement that uh, nobody really believes in, because the board actually has a fiduciary responsibility to pursue this purpose. There are two key words I like to point out. The first is elimination, because uh, a policy of reduction is, is not enough. Uh, being less unsustainable is still not sustainable. Now, the second key word is systematically, because obviously that's an ambitious goal, and we recognize we're not going to get there overnight. So we've got to make sure that every step we take takes us in the right direction. <clears throat> this is the uh, technology demonstrator that we've been developing for the last two years, and in energy efficiency terms, it consumes the equivalent of 0.95 litres of petrol per 100 kilometres. Uh, we are now working on a production vehicle, which is still on the drawing board, unfortunately, but um, will bear no relationship to this car. We've been joined by uh, Chris Wrights, who, as was pointed out, it used to be head of design at Alfa Romeo, and he designed the Fiat 500, and he's styling the new car. However, I don't believe that the principal barriers are technical at all, so I'm not really going to talk to you about cars. Uh, the, the key barriers that we face are really to do with people and politics and business inertia. And so most of my work has gone into the business strategies that are necessary for dealing with a step change. Um, <coughs> uh, <laughs> however, um, I believe that collectively we are now really in a, quite an enormous pickle. And... We need to, and we can, design our way out of this. But we do have to concentrate on the system level. Um, we have to understand all our interactions with the planet and how we organize ourselves at a system level. Specialization has been really remarkable in what it's achieved in the last couple of hundred years, but I really do believe that the breakthroughs that we now need are system level breakthroughs. So. Um, in designing River Simple, I've placed a great deal of faith in natural systems and learning from them. And uh, I would like to now explain that pickle in terms of, uh, it, it, or my interpretation of that pickle, using natural systems as, a, as an example. Evolution doesn't work in a continuous way. It, it uh, is, there are various periods of optimization and step changes. In periods of optimization, species become highly specialized and adapted to the conditions and habitat that they, they live in. Uh, but then when constraints change, uh, a major substantive change in those conditions, such as a geological shift or a climate change, a climate tipping point, there is a period of chaos and a completely new order emerges. And that order emerges from rather surprising sources, and it is not an adaption of the previous, the previous order. Those, um, what's evident from that is that the specialization that made uh, species so successful at optimizing in the periods of stability become specifically catastrophic weaknesses when faced with this step change. 
And those step changes demand completely different strategies. Uh, I, I, if we compare this with human society, I would say that we are here. Unfortunately, culturally, we have come to accept the fact or, or settled into the assumption that the models of uh, systematic uh, uh, optimization that have served us so well for the last few hundred years actually are the answer. And if we culturally have adopted that mindset, it should come as no surprise that our political and industrial system sits with this mindset as well. And that is what drives resource allocation in terms of in economic terms. Unfortunately, that means that all society's resources are focused on, on a, an incremental path forwards. So what has changed? We obviously know that climate change has come along and has hit us rather rapidly, but there's a, there's a vast body of other rising environmental issues that we're having to face. And, and in fact, there's a converging funnel of uh, these environmental pressures and regulatory uh, issues that are facing all governments and all companies in the world today. We are very good at developing and harnessing ever more remarkable technologies. We're much, it's much harder to change our systems and processes such as our business models. And the business models that uh, we uh, have today were basically shaped by the 20th century. Unfortunately, the major constraints of the 21st century simply were not on the radar in the 20th century. So things like peak resource issues, energy security, climate change. And so it's not surprising that the business models that we have are not very well suited to dealing with the, the, the issues of the 21st century. We find ourselves bumping along the walls of this converging funnel. And essentially, it's because all the models we have are designed to make more money if they're allowed to play outside the boundaries of that funnel. So I think it's an awful lot easier, now that we're faced with this step change in conditions, to design models to, de to uh, respect the, the constraints of the 21st century than it is to modify models that are really fundamentally designed to do something fundamentally different. But how do you do that? In the disruptive phase of any step change, there's a huge amount of uh, unpredictability. Uh, it's a complete fog, really. And how do you navigate your way through that? It's a bit like the, 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 the turbulent rapid, going through some turbulent rapids. You can't predetermine your path through them, but you can glimpse the calm beyond the rapids. I think the most robust way for developing a useful plan for navigating such step changes is backcasting, where you imagine a future point far enough ahead that you're past the transition, and then you plan backwards from that to work out how you got there. Having said that, my favorite joke is how do you make God laugh? You tell him your plans. So any plan you develop has got to be highly adaptive. It's got to focus much more on the high-level structural fitness for purpose of the plan than it does on the detail. And at River Simple, we've been uh, designing the technologies, developing the technologies and strategies uh, along these lines that are necessary for bringing hydrogen fuel cell cars to market. But rather than explain the whole model to you, I would like to pick out three principles that are very different in nature, but are all of generic importance. And they are governance, the sale of service, and whole system design. Uh, in corporate governance today, there is an assumption of shareholder value, the primacy of shareholder value. And I think we've got to have, develop an organizing principle that is better correlated with the interests of society than, than that. And I think also it will be in the interest of investors as well. It will serve them better. Secondly is the sale of service. Uh, the sale of product underpins our industrial society, but that rewards directly the maximization of resource consumption. And we are at the moment trying to minimize resource consumption. So I don't believe our prospects are very good whilst we continue to reward the opposite of what we're trying to achieve. 
And finally, I think we've got to recognize when legacy constraints are actually past their sell-by date and when they fundament, need a fundamental redesign at a system level. I'll use uh, hydrogen infrastructure as an example for that too. So corporate governance first, and uh, <clears throat> whilst we regard profit as terribly important, we regard resilience as much more important. You can't have a, re a profitable business without resilient, uh, a resilient business without profit anyway. It comes with the territory. But you can very easily have a profitable business that isn't resilient, and there's quite a lot of it about. So we've been working with our seed investors, uh, the, the Piek Nordhoff family, to, to, to develop this multi-stakeholder governance system. It takes the, the, the current debate about stakeholder engagement to the next logical step. If you're a stakeholder, you have a stake. Now, that doesn't mean that you have a share in the profits of the business. What it means is that you have a share in control of the enterprise. In conventional businesses today, uh, the financial investors are regarded as the owners, and that has confused the concepts of control and equity. And we're trying to tease those two apart. Um, <clears throat> governance of the company is in the hands of those six uh, stakeholder bodies at the top. There's the investors, there's the environment, there's the users of the cars and the staff. There's also the commercial partners, such as suppliers, and what we call neighbours, who are bodies who have no direct commercial relationship, like local government, who are interested in employment. And they appoint the board, the operating board. Oh, dear, sorry. They appoint the operating board, who <clears throat> have all the agility and freedom of a normal board to run the company. But there's also a stewards board which is responsible for monitoring and aud auditing. So there's a separation of the powers, much in the same way that an upper and a lower house has, in a democratic system has powers balanced. Um, <clears throat> but critically, the board has a fiduciary responsibility not to maximise shareholder value, but to balance and protect the benefit streams to those six stakeholder uh, groups. We believe that by doing so, by balancing and protecting in a partnership, in the spirit of a partnership, you will end up with a greater level of goodwill from all six stakeholders, all of whom are critical to the success of the business, than you ever can in a conventional business. How can you expect to maximise goodwill from five stakeholders whilst their interests are subordinated to the six? <clears throat> we also don't think it's a zero-sum game. All these stakeholders seek different benefit streams, and they're not mutually exclusive. So employees, for instance, are interested in livelihood. Livelihood has uh, um, an element of money, but it's not the only thing at all. And the environment isn't interested in money at all. So by and large, financial profits in this organization will be distributed in the same way as any normal company. The paradox, though, is that the investors, to get this higher level of protection for their investment, have to resign control. Because you can't have a partnership in which one partner dominates or controls because it's not a, it's not a, a partnership anymore. And indeed, our investors regard this as one of the key reasons why they're investing. This governance model also has one further benefit in that it stimulates business to, um, to uh, develop... Um, models that are aligned with the interests of the, with, with the common good, delivering, making more money from delivering what, cust what uh, society wants and needs. And so I'll come on to that now. If you sell service, uh, if you sell products, make, sell cars, you make more money by selling more cars. You're rewarded for maximising resource consumption. And uh, <coughs> that's the opposite of what your customer wants. Obsolescence and high running costs is your um, uh, paymaster. I think it's a tragedy we've developed a model that so pits the interests of, stake of, of customers against manufacturers because um, it, it, there are no winners. It compromises the outcomes for both parties. Rather than selling cars, River Simple will sell a service contract in periods of one to three years, and when, it's, when it's, uh, the contract is finished, it comes back and it goes out to a uh, second customer, a third, fourth, and so on. And this rewards... Uh, 
uh, um, longevity and low running costs rather than obsolescence and high running costs. It rewards resource efficiency rather than resource consumption. And it aligns all the interests of all the critical stakeholders involved. It also transforms the specification, performance and design of the vehicle that emerges from the business and the way that the, the, the business behaves. And unusually, for any strategy that reduces environmental impact, normally that is something on a, co a cost on the bottom line and the only way that um, will ever happen is when there's a government mandate and a level playing field. In this case, it's a source of competitive advantage, so we can pursue it unilaterally. One thing it doesn't do is <clears throat> deal with the single biggest issue that's always raised about hydrogen cars, where do you get the hydrogen? And um, <clears throat> uh, it's a chicken and egg because does the hydrogen car come first or does the hydrogen filling station come first or, or, or all of them? And the only proposal at the moment on the table is hydrogen highways. There's a hydrogen highway proposed along the south coast of Wales there. But realistically, who's going to buy a car that can drive at 120 kilometres an hour along the south coast of Wales if that's the only place you can drive your car? So, uh, yet again, we think that the answer, we need a more creative solution than just throwing money at it. Because no government, let alone, not let alone a car company, can afford to do this at the moment. And so the answer is, again, system-level change. And in this case, we're going micro. So we're a small is beautiful strategy, if you like. We're designing a car for a local market for people who want to operate in the radius of about 40 kilometers. And for us, that is a market that's quite big enough as a new entrant into the field. Um, critically, that reduces the uh, scale of infrastructure we need to unlock commercial revenues from a few hundred filling stations down to one. Now, it's a really big shift. And um, the market it creates is small, but it's commercial. And there's a much stronger case for the, the gas companies because all the cars are concentrated on one filling station and we can grow our market one location at a time in conjunction with them. And it allows us to develop the, 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 the skeleton of a nationwide network without ever taking a nationwide gamble. Now, commercial viability is absolutely critical for bringing any new ideas to market and... Uh, and I hope I've given a glimpse of why we need to design at a system level in order to deal with the, the enormous shifts that we're, we are now facing. Um, every strategy solves multiple problems, is complementary and mutually, complementary and mutually reinforcing. And one recurring theme in every strategy is aligning interests. Now, by changing in this case, not just the technology and the market segmentation, the, the, the ownership model, the infrastructure model, but also what I haven't mentioned, the manufacturing model and, and the intellectual property model, we actually uh, are reducing all the risks and the barriers. And uh, the result a model that's future-proofed and fit for the 21st century. And as the saying goes, you can't cross a chasm in two leaps. And I believe in this case, we've really got to design our way over that chasm. Thank you.